So my talk today is on uh, robotics endoscopy, and the question is, are we doing too much or are we shaping the future? Um, and these are my disclosures. And, and the question is, why, why talk about robotics and endoscopy? And, and w when I first thought about even marrying these two technologies, it wasn't because I, I really wanted to just figure out how I can use these two. It was really because someone asked me, since you have a robot in your, in your facility and you have an endoscope, can you do a talk on this? And I said, well, I, I haven't had any experience, but um, I think it's something that might have some value. So I think, um, you know, if you look at where we are today, we're in an age of continued technological advancements. And, uh, you know, whether it's uh, self-driving cars, uh, whether it's uh, cryptocurrency, the metaverse, we constantly look for new ways to, to really, new ways to change how we do things and really improve upon what we currently do. And if you look at medicine, a lot of times technology in medicine is almost always a, a lateral transfer. So if you look at the 1960s when arthroscopy first came out, it really changed the way we do orthopedic surgery today. And in the 2000s, you have a Da Vinci robot, and really that currently changed the way we do uh, gynecological uh, uh, as well as um, general surgery. And really, the longevity of these transfers of technology really depend on outcomes and the value that these uh, technologies provide. And, and in my head, I think the best technologies really elevate the standard of care we provide for our patients. So when we think about robots, we think you know, uh, of this automated, uh, you know, accurate machines that provide speed and reproducibility. And I, I really think that robots, to a degree, do provide a, a lot of these in-spine surgery. And they really open the door for MIS applications as through the many talks we heard today. And there's many, uh, many articles we can, we can dive into, talk about how uh, they do provide some advantages. Um, but really, for me, the value for a robot uh, in spine surgery today is allowing a rapid workflow. You can really place these screws pretty seamlessly if you have a nice workflow. It allows the door for single position lateral surgery, as well as multi-level, minimally invasive uh, percutaneous fusion. The cons are the cons for almost all technologies. There's cost. There's uh, the cost of capital and disposables. Uh, there's a learning curve for robotic spine surgery. Uh, I think it's about 25 cases for endoscopic spine surgery around the same, a little bit more, maybe 30, 35. But really, the the, the biggest functional. Uh, limitation of the robot in spine surgery, it is not a robot in its truest sense, it's a cobot. It's essentially an assistant for us to do, perform certain tasks, as everyone knows. And the FDA defines the use of the robot in spine surgery as a user-operated trajectory planning, which essentially at this point is just placing pedicle screws. So really, if you think about it, a robot's essentially holding a little bit like a tube or a straw for us to work through, and really there's no current use in decompression, implant placement, fusion, and, and that's currently where I see the limitations of robot uh, in terms of my practice. If you look at the endoscope, I think of the endoscope as, as almost like ninja surgery. It, it provides targeted access, you're in and out, you go to the pathology and you get out, and, and you're not really disrupting much else. And, and, and that's because the size of the endoscope, it's, it's maneuverable, it's seven millimeters, you have a working channel, you have a 30 degree uh, angulation, you can look around corners, and what that lends itself to is you could essentially save yourself by uh, saving a lot of bony resection and preventing instability in the future. You can see this is with a tube, how much bone was removed versus an endoscope because you can go in, look around the corner, and decompress that way as well as that way. And in the end, all this self lends itself to is, is less pain and quicker recovery, and it opens the door for wide awake surgery possibilities. And truly, an endoscope truly is the most minimally evasive spine surgery you can perform. And I won't belabor the point of literature, there, there's a multitude of randomized controlled trials, whether it's in lumbar, cervical, uh, et cetera, which show that uh, you know, th this is a viable technique and the outcomes are, if not equal, if not better than open techniques. And it works in the right hands if you're trained the right way. So, but the question then everyone asked me, what's the, what's, the, what's the role or when do you use endoscopy? And really, Currently, it's really decompression procedures. You know, and, and we all know a good decompression is a happy patient. It's the most reliable way to ensure a good outcome in spine surgery. But we all know not all decompressions are equal. You can see this is a thoracic disc. You can see uh, the spinal cord compression that's caused by the disc. And post-discectomy, you can see the, uh, the fecal sac is completely decompressed. And uh, some of these decompressions really vary in invasiveness and complexity. You can see this is a T-lift cage that backed out that Dr. Hofstetter, when I did fellowship with him, was able to uh, um, burr out with an endoscope. And this is the, the tubular retractor protecting the neural elements while you do this. 
So we, we published a paper a couple of years ago talking about the benefit zone of endoscopic spine surgery. And really, the, 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 the point of this paper is that when you're talking about very simple procedures, like a discectomy, it really doesn't matter what you do. You could do it open, the tube, you can do it with an endoscope. Uh, as long as you take the pressure off the nerve, the patient is going to do great. It's really the benefit zone, really, uh, you see that as the alternative options become more increasingly in uh, invasive and complex. So when you get to a laminectomy with spondylolisthesis and they don't want a fusion, uh, it might uh, prevent you from destabilizing the spine. When you do cervical thoracic discs, uh, it's, it makes it very, very safe. And obviously, we're going to talk about orthodesis today. So when you look at the current state of robotics and endoscopy, you can see that uh, I, I had to figure out how I can use these two technologies and what's the workflow. And Dr. Dr. Kim mentioned uh, the importance of a workflow when using technologies, and, and that makes it uh, a lot easier to handle these technologies in a way that will suit you and save time in the OR. So uh, looking at the best of both worlds, I figured how can I utilize these two technologies? And I, I, the best way to do that is you start with the image guidance, which is pretty much the basis for all robotics. And the image guidance will then allow you to do robotic targeting and then to to eliminate that, that blind faith that we're always worried about with robotic uh, uh, guidance is in the endoscopic visualization. And putting these three parts together allow you to really be comfortable with the technology you're using. So before I started to, to try this on a, you know, try this technology in an actual patient, I wanted to go to the lab and make sure I can get the workflow down and in a way that, that makes the most sense and, and it's best for the patient. So this is a little uh, video that we did uh, in the lab with the Globus robot to plan, uh, plan the actual uh, endoscopic robotic fusion. So you can see this trajectory plan that we started with. You can see this is the cage I wanted. You, this is the trans-SAP approach, which you may or may not have heard of from Dr. Hofstetter in his talk. Uh, and and uh, you can see this is the robotic planning uh, that we, we start with the, the guidance, and that allows you to plan your trajectory. Dr. Hofstetter used the trefines, but I'm using a, a, a navigator drill to kind of take some of the superior articular process off. And then once we get down to the disk base, I use my endoscope to confirm where I am. And you can see, if you look at the video here, that is superior articular process right there. And this is, a, this is some yellow ligament, and I'm just going to shave some of that superior articular process down. And then when I get to the disk base, I'm going to then uh, mallet the, um, the tubular retractor into the disk base at the correct uh, orientation. Then you do your standard workflow, which uh, uh, you use a fluoroscopic guided uh, discectomy with a variety of shavers and other instruments that uh, Dr. Hofstetter previously discussed. And really, uh, the benefits of endoscopic spine surgery come is, is when you start going to the next level and put the endoscope in the disk space and really confirm, you can see this large chunk of fragment, of disk fragment we were able to remove that you weren't able to remove when you did it with the, with the fluoroscopy. And then you can see after I'm done with the discectomy, I have a nice uh, end plate preparation here and you, you can really evaluate the whole disk space. And then uh, this is the part where you, you, you kind of use a robot or the navigation to put the, the cage into the correct trajectory. Obviously, use fluoro to, to confirm this is an expandable cage. And this is uh, viewing the cage inside uh, after you've uh, placed it. So the next is to, let me see, the next is to, is to actually try this on an actual patient. And um, this is an 80-year-old female, uh, community ambulator with back pain and neurogenic claudication. Uh, she's nerve vascular intact, and you can see in her x-ray, she's got a spondylolisthesis at L4-5 with disc space collapse. And the MRI shows she's got significant central and lateral recess as well as foraminal stenosis. So what was the plan for this patient? The, the plan was to do a robotic-assisted endoscopic inner body fusion with expandable mesh cage percutaneous robotic-assisted particular fixation, and endoscopic laminectomy, uh, ULBD, at L4-5. So again, it all starts with the planning. It all starts with uh, getting the O-arm spin, and uh, the current technology, the robot, does not allow you to pl plan for a cage. Um, on, 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 I, I don't think we got the software update on that, but that's, I think, coming in the pipeline. But you can see I used the screw as a placeholder for the cage for my trajectory that I wanted. And then um, once we got the O-arm spin and registered the uh, images to uh, the um, uh, robot, we're able to start the case. And we always start with the robotic assisted pedicle screw insertion. You can see it's pretty pretty straightforward here. Uh, we're able to place uh, uh, a rapid workflow uh, screws, actually K-wires through a burr, drill, tap, and K-wire, all pretty much within 30 seconds. I didn't place the screw directly only because I'm using the um, uh, a transforaminal approach. I didn't want the screw heads to interfere with the inner body trajectory. 
And then the next step is going to be the robotic trajectory and the disk prep. You can see that we use a robot to uh, plan the trajectory. And then we were able to start by, uh, by doing a preliminary discectomy, uh, what we call blind, and then use fluoroscopy to confirm um, my discectomy. And a lot of times, uh, uh, this is with a spinology's cage, uh, I'm always told that you know, it's going to be a good discectomy, just trust the balloon. I never trust the balloon because I don't believe the balloon can really show you exactly what you're looking at. So I think the endoscope really adds a lot of value to, to, to endoscopic discectomies, uh, um, sorry, endoscopic uh, fusions. You can see here, this is my, my end plate prep once I was done. And I feel very confident that I had an excellent end plate prep. You can see bone on both sides, and I can actually go and plane the end plates even more with this uh, diamond burr, really making sure that this is, is going to uh, have an excellent outcome for this patient with a, with a great fusion by having nice bony bleeding uh, uh, at the end plates. And then once I'm done with the, uh, with the discectomy or the um, uh, this end plate prep, I will then go on and I put the implant in with the expandable mesh cage. You can see that we had nice restoration of the disc height uh, and then we finished by placing the screws. And then I've completed my, my laminectomy. You can see this, the thecal sac. I know it's kind of tough to see, but this is the lateral margin of the traversing nerve root here. And this is the axilla of the nerve as well. So you can see we had a nice decompression as well. And this is the patient at three months. You can see she has a little stab incisions. I was able to do um, screw placement uh, through these four incisions here, the laminectomy through this tiny little incision here, and this is the uh, incision for the uh, transforaminal uh, endoscopic fusion. So you know, the final points of, of, of this whole talk is that robotics is currently limited in its applications, and there's a lot uh, that we can do with the robot in the future. I think system agnostic uh, navigated disk preps will be an excellent option for the future. I think having applications for decompression as well as uh, possible automation of some of these steps would be great, and that's where the, the AI comes in. At the end, all, these, uh, all this technology does is, is provide tools for us, and these tools give us more data points. And really, what I think this, uh, these technologies do is they provide increasing access for more surgeons to perform minimally invasive spine surgery. And uh, the question then becomes, if we're allowing more surgeons to perform these procedures, are we, in fact, elevating the standard of care and providing for our patients by allowing more of the community to have uh, to provide our patients with these types of uh, surgeries. And the question is, what is the cost? And I'd like to kind of, you know, kind of circle back uh, to 20 years ago, you know, when, or 40 years ago when uh, arth arthroscopic surgery first came out. If you look at the study, a randomized control study, no difference between um, an open and an arthroscopic ACL. And then you look at this one about rotator cuffs. Again, no difference between open and arthroscopic rotator cuffs. But the question you have to ask yourself is, is in, this, in this time period, have we elevated the standard of care for these conditions? And we have, because no one does open uh, rotator cuffs and ACLs anymore. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, curious, how long did that um, your first case take you? So the the first case, the longest part of the case was that trajectory planning because the wasn't the system wasn't meant to have a screw being in that trajectory. So that probably took maybe forty minutes the whole case. And but the actual discectomy probably took an hour. Screw placement probably like ten minutes. And the the laminectomy probably took the longest, an hour and ten minutes. Um, but all that together, probably around being four hours, roughly. Um, but I think it could be a lot faster. It's my first time doing it. I think no, uh, having the correct software, getting everything dialed in, it'll probably make it a lot faster. Yeah, so, uh, fantastic talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. And I think great innovation there. You know, <clears throat> actually, this is a question that you kind of have, uh, you know, inter intercepted or interceded in my brain uh, when you spend the time with me. So I'll, <laughs> I'll push it right back to you. What is the movie called? Interception, right? <laughs> um, you know, f when do you see, um, you know, the, there's a, on the, on the benefit curve, the curves cross. Mm -hmm. 
and I did that intentionally. Let me put this graph up there mm -hmm. to kind of annoy you. But um, no, but <laughs> where do you think with endoscopic technology comes in like uniportal, biportal, where is that crossing point? And where is the robotic technology? Where does it cross that it's just a nuisance and just doesn't add any value? So where do you think this is right now and what is the technology to, that's going to push it to the right? Well, you know, I think uh, currently we're not, we're, we're definitely not there yet. I think I had to really jerry rig the whole system for it to work what I was trying to do. So I think that's not how it should be. That's why it took a lot longer. But I think as they make the instruments better, as the, the robot incorporates an endoscope as, an, as a possible way you can add to the surgery, all these things will make it easier to do. And then once it becomes easier for the the average community surgeon to do it, that's when the value really adds on. It's not like a, a very specialized thing that only five people in the country are doing. I think that's when the benefit zone is gonna be more of a benefit to the entire community than just that specific patient. That's what I look at. The biportal thing. So I think, uh, you know, I always always talk to you about the biportal when we were uh, in fellowship is because, because, because <laughs> with orthopedics, we use a lot of, two, we use two scopes. And uh, I think there's certain value in the biportal. I don't, I don't, I'm not a doctor of, I'm a uniportal endoscope versus biportal. I think, like, I had to do a dural tear repair once and I need another portal. And I put that portal and I was able to do it with sutures. So I think, I think you have to just know when you need to be able to do those things and be facile with, with all the techniques so you have everything in your, in your bag of tricks to perform these techniques. All right, thank you so much. Great, great talk.